Hello. Today we are finally going to talk about hormones and the reproductive system. We're going to talk briefly about asexual reproduction, then we'll go right into sexual reproduction and how its evolutionary significance comes into play. We're going to talk about how hormones regulate the male and the female reproductive systems, and we're going to talk about the negative and positive feedback loops that are at work in these systems. Asexual reproduction is when only one parent is contributing genetic information. Sexual reproduction is when two parents contribute genetic information. There's some cute examples that I found here. So in asexual reproduction, we have binary fission. Some bacteria and protists, including this euglena in the picture, can reproduce by binary fission. Yeast are a species that can do budding. Parthenogenesis is reproduction without fertilization. So in species like this lizard, this is a New Mexico whiptail lizard, a female can have an unfertilized egg that grows into a zygote and eventually an entire new offspring. This is an all-female species of lizard. Some plants and animals can reproduce by fragmentation, and that means part of an organism breaks off and grows into a new individual. You might have seen this in starfish. Uh, coral uh, that are pictured can reproduce by fragmentation, and humans have been exploiting this to try to create coral nurseries where they regrow and try to restore an endangered coral reef. And that's actually all we're going to say for sexu asexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction, they follow this model where the organism is typically diploid, meaning it has two N chromosomes, and for reproduction, those diploid cells undergo a process called meiosis in which they produce haploid gametes, which are also called sex cells. Two of these gametes will come together in fertilization to create a new diploid zygote, and that zygote will undergo mitosis to produce a whole new organism. And humans do this. Today we're going to talk about specifically how hormones direct the human reproductive system, but know that it's similar for most mammals. Um, in humans, our haploid gametes have n equals 23, so 23 chromosomes, and diploid, so most of the cells in our body, have 46. The only haploid cells would be our eggs and our sperm. If we look at sexual reproduction, there are tons of reasons why it's not a good idea. It's slower, you have to find a mate to do it, you can't just do it alone, and you have to undergo meiosis, which is this complex process that you learned all the steps about. So if there are all these disadvantages, then there's got to be some huge advantage that outweighs that to make it so that so many organisms evolved to do sexual reproduction. And that big outweighing advantage is the offspring diversity. Sexual reproduction is producing a lot more diversity in offspring than asexual reproduction is capable of producing. And this is advantageous because in evolution, you know, we are selecting among offspring and if there's more diversity among offspring, then there's a greater chance that a beneficial trait will arise and that trait can be selected for in natural selection. This diversity of the offspring drives the natural selection. We're going to go over briefly the male and female reproductive anatomy. In the male, the penis, its job is to deliver semen into the vagina, and it also functions in urination. The testicles, uh, plural, is sometimes called testes. They produce and secrete the sex hormones, mainly testosterone, but a little bit of estrogen and other steroid hormones. The testes are also the site of spermatogenesis, the formation of the sperm. Spermatogenesis happens continuously throughout life, but it drops off in older men. Uh, the epididymis attached to the testes are the place where the sperm develop and mature. And this tube leading up is the vas deferens. Sperm will travel through this tube during ejaculation. Uh, the tube will also receive fluids contributed by the prostate gland and the seminal vesicle, some other glands that are not pictured. Ultimately, the sperm is nurtured by those fluids. The fluids provide a 
safe environment for the sperm. And altogether, all the fluids plus the sperm cells will be called the semen. The semen will ejaculate through the urethra. In the female reproductive system, we have the ovaries which produce estrogens. Um, side note, estrogen is not actually a hormone, it's a group of hormones. The most common one, most prevalent one in the f humans is estradiol. Estr uh, so just know that estrogen doesn't actually refer to any specific chemical or hormone. The ovary, in addition to producing estrogens, is also the site of eugenesis, the production of the ova or eggs. Uh, this is not constant throughout life. In fact, by the time a girl is born, her ovaries have already produced all the eggs that she will have for her entire life. The fallopian tube is a tube through which the egg is released in ovulation and the egg travels down the tube. Sperm need to travel up the tube to meet the egg and fertilize it. The uterus is also called the womb because it's the place where the fertilized egg will implant. And the endometrium is the mucous membrane of the uterus. This endometrium needs to provide a nurturing environment for the fertilized egg and its nature will change throughout the female reproductive cycle. And we have the cervix. The cervix produces mucus that is sometimes thicker and sometimes thinner and this regulates fertility. We have the vagina which is also known as the birth canal. It's a muscular canal that functions to receive the sperm and to also deliver the baby. And the vulva, actually, this is not well labeled. Vulva really refers to all of the external female genitals, including the vaginal opening, the urethral opening, the labia, and the clitoris. Okay. So if we look at either the testes or the ovaries, they are both, their actions are both governed by hormones coming from the brain, very similarly. First we have the hypothalamus here that's shaded. Hypothalamus is producing a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone, GNRH. The job of GNRH is to travel a very short distance down into the pituitary gland. By the way, the pituitary gland is located not, it's not technically part of the brain, but it's hanging off of the brain pretty much, but it's not considered a part of the brain. It is a gland on its own. When the pituitary gland receives these GNRH signals, it will produce LH and FSH. These stand for luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. So that's all it does. It takes a signal from the hypothalamus. It makes LH and FSH. These two hormones will then enter the circulation of the entire body. They will make their way to the gonads, either the testicles or the ovaries, and they will stimulate production of testosterone in the testes and estrogen and progesterone in the ovaries. They will also be responsible for signaling the production of sperm in the testes and the development of the ovaries, which will eventually, development of the ova, which are the eggs, and eventually one of those eggs will be ovulated. We call this entire system the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, the HPG axis. The way it regulates how much of the sex hormones are produced is by negative feedback. Any testosterone that's produced, it will be circulating in the blood in the entire body. And when it gets back to the hypothalamus, it's going to exert negative feedback. That's what I've drawn here, this uh, bar with the negative symbol. The testosterone in the body will signal the hypothalamus to make less GnRH. Uh, testosterone also exerts negative feedback on the pituitary gland to make less LH and FSH. And this functions to control the amount of testosterone being produced. Um, if there is too much testosterone being produced, then there's going to be a lot of negative feedback on the hypothalamus and the pituitary. The hypothalamus is going to make less GnRH. The pituitary will make less LH and FSH, and then that will result in less input into the testes and eventually lower the amount of testosterone being produced. Similarly, on this side, 
the estrogen and progesterone exert the same kind of negative feedback in females on the hypothalamus and pituitary. So this serves to control the amount of sex hormones being made. If there's too much being made, there will be a lot of negative feedback back to the brain and the pituitary gland, resulting in less LH and FSH, resulting in less of a sex hormone. Okay, the rest of this lecture is going to be primarily focused on the female reproductive system, and we're going to go into a pretty fine level of detail on what happens there. As we do this, I want you to focus on hormones and the negative feedback, and sometimes positive feedback loops that will control the system. I don't want you to focus too much on naming every single part, but it's about understanding the idea of the feedback system. So in the ovary, there are hundreds and thousands of follicles, and a follicle consists of one egg surrounded by a layer of protective cells called granulosa cells. Follicles will start off here as primary follicles, and some of them, due to the hormone signal FSH, that's called follicle stimulating hormone, some of them will become stimulated to grow larger. Um, as they grow, eventually they will develop if they grow large enough, a pocket of fluid called an antrum. At this point, we'd call it a mature follicle, getting ready for ovulation. As the follicles grow larger, they also produce more and more estrogen. In this case, it's LH, luteinizing hormone, that is a signal that tells them to make more and more estrogen. Primary follicles grow into secondary follicles, eventually we just call them mature follicles that are ready for ovulation. Only some of the developing follicles will grow on to become mature follicles. They have to have these additional features like the antrum and the outer layers of protective cells. At the time of each ovulation, there will be several mature follicles around ready to ovulate, but actually most of them are going to die only one of them is going to be chosen to be released in this ovulation. And that's because the, we want to, the uh, body needs to allow the one remaining follicle to have access to all the nutrients. The, it can't have any competition around it. So at the time of ovulation, the egg is going to be released here with a layer of protective cells. As it makes its way down the fallopian tube, the leftover follicle that it came from will become the corpus luteum, uh, meaning yellow body, and the corpus luteum will actually stick around for the next two weeks. It has a, an important role in producing hormones. It produces a lot of progesterone and a little bit, a uh, small amount of estrogen. Uh, these two hormones function to support the egg that was released to make sure that it stays functioning and that it's able to implant into the uterus if it should happen to be fertilized. At the end of this menstrual cycle, if the egg hasn't been fertilized, then there's no more need for the corpus luteum and it will regress and break down. On average, this process coming from a primary follicle growing and producing lots of estrogen all the way into being a mature follicle as I said, not all follicles do this, and the ones that do, it takes 13 menstrual cycles to make this journey in development. For every follicle that makes it to the mature stage, maybe hundreds will die without making it there. And when a woman has no more follicles remaining, then she's entered menopause, which means uh, the cessation of the reproductive cycle. Um, I looked up on Google menopause and it said it's very common, which is kind of a weird way to put it because it should happen to everyone so long as they make it to that age. Um, here's a micrograph of an ovary and we can see it here. Here's a relatively immature follicle. Here's a very large, very developed follicle with an antrum. It probably is producing lots of estrogen. We have some primordial follicles, which are the very earliest kinds. There's really all kinds of follicles there at the same time, and so I don't want you to think that like there's they just follow this loop around. Really, they, there's no rules to how they're arranged. But at any given time, 
there's only one or maybe a few large follicles that are still developing. As I said, most of them, if they're a large follicle, they are going to die off before ovulation. Only one egg can be ovulated per cycle. So here this is laid out as a timeline. We split the reproductive cycle down the middle at the point of ovulation. And we would call the first half the follicular phase because the follicles are growing. And the second half is the luteal phase because the corpus luteum, this stuff left behind from the follicle, is there. And the corpus luteum is producing estrogen and progesterone, which is supporting that egg that just got ovulated. A cycle is on average 28 days, though it's if it's shorter or longer by a few days, that's still normal as long as it's a consistent cycle length. During the first half of the cycle, we call it the follicular phase, follicles growing. Second half of the cycle, luteal phase, because the corpus luteum is there and it's producing hormones that are needed by the ovulated egg. Um, and in the case that the egg doesn't get fertilized, there's no zygote, then the corpus luteum after on the 28th day will start to degrade into the corpus albicans, that means white body, because that's literally the colors that they are, yellow body, white body. Um, if the egg does get fertilized, so the woman is pregnant, then different hormonal signals will tell the corpus luteum to stick around, to stay intact, and to keep producing hormones to support that fertilized egg for the next eight to nine weeks of pregnancy. So now that we've seen this, the reproductive cycle from the perspective of the ovary, let's look at it from the perspective of the uterus. We have some parallel things going on here. In the uterus, the lining of the uterus, the endometrium, can be either thick or thin. Um, during the first half of the cycle, the uterus is in the proliferative phase, so it's proliferating, or the cells are dividing, and the endometrium is growing in thickness. It continues to grow throughout the entire cycle, but in the second half, it is in the secretory phase because it is secreting important proteins into the uterus that are going to help support any fertilized egg that would implant. And really, I shouldn't say fertilized egg, that, but uh, because by the time anything implants, it's not going to be a single cell. It's going to be a uh, blastocyst, so a ball of cells that will eventually be the fetus or the baby. So the endometrium first becomes thicker, and then it continues getting thicker and also secretes special proteins. It's becoming very rich in blood, so it's becoming vascularized. The fertilized egg, if it does implant, will definitely need a blood supply. And you need to know that during this secretory phase, the signal that's telling the endometrium to secrete these proteins is progesterone. Progesterone, which, being, which is being made by the corpus luteum, signals the endometrium to secrete proteins in preparation for the implantation of, possibly implantation of, a blastocyst. If by the end of the 28-day cycle, no blastocyst has implanted, then the endometrium will shed off all the lining that it's built up over this cycle in menses or menstruation. It will get back to a state of a thin endometrium and go through the cycle again of thickening and the secretory phase. So here's a comic about menstruation. At the end of that 28-day cycle, the uterus says, hey, your uterus here. Just wanted to let you know I've got everything prepped for the baby. And then you say, I'm not having a baby. And it unleashes an onslaught of bleeding. We want to understand how the sex hormones and also the overarching hormones how they regulate these changes in the ovary and in the uterus.
First we're going to look at estradiol. That's one of the estrogens in yellow. And estradiol, during the first half, the follicular phase of the cycle, estradiol is steadily increasing, increasing more sharply toward the end. And remember, estradiol is being made by the growing follicle. FSH tells them to grow. LH tells them to make more and more estrogen. So as they grow bigger, they make more estradiol. And during the luteal phase, the second half, there is a lot of progesterone being produced by the corpus luteum and also a modest amount of estrogen being produced by the corpus luteum. Both of these are functioning to support that egg that's been ovulated in case it might be fertilized by a sperm. We're going to look at also the pituitary hormones now, so LH in blue and FSH in green. They are going to explain the exact shapes of these graphs of estradiol and progesterone. So during the first half, or maybe even in the very beginning, we have modest amounts of LH and FSH. Remember, FSH is telling the follicle to grow. LH is telling the follicle to make estrogen, estradiol specifically. That's why we have this rise in estradiol. But remember, we have that negative feedback loop. Here, so as more estradiol is being made, it's going to be exerting negative feedback on the pituitary gland. It's going to be telling the pituitary gland, hey, there's enough estrogen here. You can stop making that much LH and FSH. And that's exactly what happens. Around day 12, we see a dip in the amount of FSH being produced. This drop in FSH means that Remember, FSH is what tells the follicles to grow. When this dip happens, most of the growing follicles are going to die out because they need that FSH as constant stimulation. Only the largest, the most developed follicle will survive that dip right here. And so that's what causes most of those developing follicles to die out. Only the largest and most prepared follicle will survive. And that's good because you only want to ovulate one at a time. When we have are left with just that one surviving follicle, it's going to continue to make estradiol. And in fact, it's so large and so mature that it makes more than all the rest of them we're making combined. We hit a peak in estradiol right before ovulation. At this point, when estradiol is that high, it's actually going to switch the feedback modes of the body. It's going to switch the, the HPG axis from negative feedback into now positive feedback. In a positive feedback mode, estrogen and progesterone are increasing the amount of GnRH and LH and FSH being made. So in a totally different mode, just momentarily, Let's see what that leads to. If we're in the positive feedback mode, then the high amount of estradiol is going to tell the pituitary gland to make a high amount of LH and a high amount of FSH. So we get a spike in LH and a spike in FSH. This LH spike is going to signal to the ovary to finally release that follicle. It's going to signal ovulation precisely at 14 days. After this point, estradiol drops, the body returns back to its regular negative feedback state, and we enter the second half of the cycle. And in the second half, this is the luteal phase, so we have the corpus luteum making a lot of progesterone and some estrogen. Progesterone, think of that as, as the word says, progestation, so pro-pregnancy. The primary function of progesterone is to stimulate the uterus to keep on thickening and to secrete proteins that will make the uterine lining hospitable for any potential fetus that would implant there. 
And there's been a lot of attention uh, given to this point right here, the 14-day ovulation point. And that's because people want to know when is a woman going to be most fertile and when will she most likely be able to get pregnant. Um, families, a lot of people really want to have children. It's important to them. So we know that there's a lot of interest in this point in time right here, the point of ovulation where the egg is released. We know that the spike in LH causes that ovulation, and we know that the spike in LH happens because at this point the body temporarily enters a positive feedback loop instead of a negative feedback loop. Also from observations, we know that in that day right after ovulation, the body temperature goes up by some fractions of a percent. And it's going up because of an increased production of progesterone by the corpus luteum. In fact, uh, one of the kind of do-it-yourself plan family planning methods that are practiced by some families is to measure body temperature and to look for that spike in a couple fractions of a degree and think, okay, this is the point where she's most likely to have ovulated and to be the most fertile. Um, this doesn't have great predictive power because you need a very precise thermometer and it's just not very deterministic. This is a complicated chart. The main things that I want you to get out of this are the ways in which negative and positive feedback determine the profiles of levels of these hormones and how they affect what happens in the uterus and what happens in the ovary with the follicles. If you can use the HPG axis to explain these things, you'll be in good shape. You need to be able to explain why there is this dip in FSH around day 12 of the cycle, why shortly after that is there this big spike in estradiol, why directly right at the time of ovulation there is a spike in LH and one in FSH, and in the luteal phase why there's so much progesterone around, then you'll be in good shape. And now that we've talked about how this reproductive cycle works naturally, we're going to talk about a few ways in which drugs can modulate what happens here. Hormonal birth control consists of these pills of either estrogen or progesterone, or some of the formulations contain just progesterone. But either way, we call them exogenous because they're coming from outside of the body. They're not being made by the body. They will both serve to suppress this HPG axis. Remember, uh, estrogen and progesterone that gets made by the body, it feeds back negatively on the hypothalamus and the pituitary. When we take exogenous estrogen and progesterone, the body can't tell the difference. It also exerts negative feedback, so it reduces the amount of GnRH being made it reduces the amount of LH and FSH being made. And so what's going to be the consequence? FSH is follicle stimulating hormone. It stimulates the ovary, ovary follicles to grow, so the follicles won't grow. LH stimulates the follicles to make estrogen, so they won't be making estrogen either. The ovary is going to be full of follicles that are not growing and maturing. They're not getting ready to ovulate. Um, ultimately, when someone's taking birth control, pregnancy is prevented because either no follicle got released because there wasn't any follicle that was mature enough to ovulate, or uh, a follicle does get released but it's unable to implant in the uterus due to an inhospitable environment. Remember, progesterone and somewhat estrogen are involved in making the uterus thicken and create those special proteins to make it a good environment. Um, and then a third way this can work is that the birth control pills cause the cervical mucus, which is responsive to hormones as well. It, the mucus gets too thick and sperm are not able to pass through. So various ways in which they prevent pregnancy, but they all hinge on this ability of exogenous estrogen and progesterone to suppress the HPG axis via negative feedback. You'll recall that the male reproductive system follows the same HPG axis, and one way that can be impacted by drugs is performance-enhancing drugs uh, taken either for uh, bodybuilding or for sports. Uh, these drugs consist of anabolic steroids, 
Remember, anabolic means uh, building up, so that they're meant to build polymers of muscle. And these steroids in the body, they're going to get metabolized into just testosterone, which the body produces anyway. This exogenous testosterone is going to suppress the HVG axis. It's going to suppress the hypothalamus production of GnRH, and it's going to suppress the production of LH and FSH in the pituitary. LH and FSH are responsible for telling the testicles to produce testosterone and telling them to produce sperm. So even though the body has plenty of testosterone around, it's not receiving these signals from the pituitary saying to make sperm, so the sperm count goes down. And this can be a rather unwanted side, side effect of using these drugs in competitions. And the last way of modulating this pathway that I want to talk to you about involves children, like young children, pre-puberty, like under 10 years old. Uh, increasingly, more young children are coming forth and saying, I was assigned one gender, but I don't feel like I am that gender. I, I want to do a transition. Or I'm not sure if I want to transition, but I don't want to go through puberty because I think it would be really hard on me emotionally and perhaps physically as well. And so there are children who want to delay their puberty. And that can be done and that in fact is a common practice, delaying puberty. It doesn't have long-term effects if somebody wants to delay their puberty for a while and then uh, resume it if they wish. But the way that's done is through hormone blockers. In this case, these hormone blockers are going to work at the site of the pituitary gland. In the pituitary gland, remember, it receives signals from GnRH. So if it's receiving more GnRH, it makes more LH and FSH. If it receives no GnRH, it's going to make very little of these two hormones. In the pituitary gland, the cells have these GnRH receptors, GnRHR. And their ligand is the GnRH hormone. Um, the hormone blocker in this case is called luprolide and it's a drug that very closely resembles the shape of GnRH and it's going to fit into the same ligand binding site as GnRH. It's going to fit into the receptor but it's not going to activate the receptor. So it's taking up that space but it's not actually causing the pituitary to make these two hormones that it should be making. So the result of this is that the GnRH receptors are all plugged up, but the pituitary gland isn't making any LH or FSH. And so the either testes or ovaries are not making the sex hormones that they would be making. Truly, the hypothalamus is going to produce a lot of GnRH because it's not going to be receiving any negative feedback from down here. But no matter how much GnRH it produces, that GnRH is going to be outcompeted by the exogenous drug, the luprolide. So when luprolide outcompetes the body's natural GnRH, um, we get this effect of blocking puberty in young children. The mechanism here is really similar to what you guys know about enzymes and competitive inhibition. But in this case, since it's not, in, it's not an enzyme, it's a receptor, luprolide would be called a drug that acts as an antagonist. It's a GnRH antagonist because it takes the place of GnRH and it prevents GnRH from exerting its effect on these cells. So there's three ways in which drugs can modulate the pathway here, the HPG axis. Um, most important thing out of this lecture is that you understand how this pathway works, uh, the ways in which it changes during the uh, female reproductive cycle, and the ways in which we can exploit our knowledge of negative feedback. Alright, thanks for watching.